Good morning, guys. Today I'm going to talk about one important topic, not only in surgery, but in other you know aspects of medicine also. That is blood transfusion. Blood transfusion. In this topic, we'll talk about what are the different indications of blood transfusion. What are the different types of blood transfusion? What do you mean by whole blood transfusion? What is pack cell transfusion? What are the components of blood transfusion? What are the blood reactions? Okay, and a lot of other things. So this is a very important practical lecture. So let's move further. Now, right in the beginning, let's talk about what are the indications of blood transfusion. Means in which situation we give blood to the patient. One of the very easy answer is acute blood loss following trauma. If that blood loss is more than 15% of the total body volume, okay, uh, less than that, we can wait and watch. But if you think uh, in a short period of time, a lot of bleeding will happen, then you make blood ready. And if it is necessary, you just give it. That is the way. In case of liver, spleen, kidney, GI tract injury, different type of fractures, hemothorax and perineal injury, there may be large amount of blood loss and quickly this more than 15% will be crushed. So we need blood in this type of injury. See that? Liver rupture, spleen rupture, okay? kidney damage because of trauma and different other types. Another indication is during major surgery, like abdominal perineal surgery, thoracic surgery, and hepatobiliary surgery, we need blood. Blood transfusion is necessary because these are the major surgery, there is high chance of blood loss during surgery. So we need to replace it. Following burns, okay? Following burns, uh, we may need blood or different, you know, uh, uh, different parts of the blood, I should say. Okay. Now, having said that, one of the important point I like to highlight here, during burns, there is not a major bleeding because burns will cause coagulation of the blood vessel. So bleeding is not massive. However, having said that, okay, there is a, a loss of large amount of albumin or protein from the body. Okay. Now, to replace that, we need to give albumin in some of the patient. If the patient suffer from anemia you know, because of some other different infection, which are very common in burns, we need to give different types of, you know, fraction of the blood. In septicemia, we need to give blood transfusion. Okay, the WBC transfusion is quite commonly given in septicemia, and septicemia can easily give uh, give rise to DIC. So what type of blood you give in DIC? Anybody? What is given in DIC treatment? You give blood transfusion, but which type of blood? Plasma. Yes, plasma. Say, it. say it again. Frozen plasma. Exactly, fresh frozen plasma. Very good, fresh frozen plasma because because we need, we need those factors which are utilized there, right? So fresh frozen plasma is usually given. And if uh, platelets are very low, you can give platelet transfusion as well. So see, this is the way, this is the type of blood transfusion. Now another one, as a prophylactic measure prior to surgery, and these are the good example for you or scenarios, whole blood is given in acute blood loss, already talked about. Pack cells are given in chronic anemic situation. Now, why in chronic anemia, you don't give whole blood? Who can answer this? Why? Anyone? Sir, because Sir, in, in, in because anemia, yes, one. Yeah, yes, yes, good, good, good. Yes, go on, please. Yeah. Uh, anemia is related to yeah. only the patient red blood cells no. are going to display. So we are going to give the pack cell that contain on red blood cell. Okay, Irfan, yes, you can continue now. Yeah. Sir, anemia is only due to the low hemoglobin level and the low oxygen supply. So that's why we give only a pack cell of uh, RBC and uh, which improve the hemoglobin level. Okay, so see the different... Sir, may I? Yeah, yeah, please, please, sure. 
ऑलरेडीटेडन and chronic anemia is a wonderful example of hyperdynamic circulation is absolutely correct there is more plasma volume already heart is already you know adapted to that situation i don't want to give too much fluid overload in case of chronic anemia or hyperdynamic circulation i just want to give packed rbc okay only rbc that's enough so always remember this pack cells are given in chronic anemia and if pack cells are not available you can give whole blood but always make sure you give one shot of diuretics after giving whole blood to flush every fluid you have given to outside one shot of diuretic that is furosemide given after giving whole blood in case of anemic situation but if pack cells are available they are the best Let's move on. Blood fraction are given in ITP and hemophilia. Now, in ITP, we want to give platelet. Okay, though that platelet will be quickly destroyed, but still, to buy time, we we have to give platelet here. And in case of hemophilia, which factor we give in hemophilia treatment? Which factor? That we give the clotting factor because of the bleeding disorder, sir. That's why. Yeah. So, which factor? Uh, deficiency leads to hemophilia. Which factor? Clotting factor eight. 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 Yes, eight and nine. Okay. Hemophilia A means clotting factor eight deficiency. Nine deficiency leads to hemophilia B. So hemophilia A is much more common than B. So you can safely answer eight. Factor eight is given in the treatment of hemophilia. Nice. Okay. So let's move on. now before we give uh, you know blood transfusion we need to make sure certain criteria in the donor now donor or the person who donates the blood should be fit without any serious diseases like hiv hepatitis b hepatitis c and malaria he should be free of any serious disease that is especially the infectious diseases and the weight of the donor should be more than 45 kg so these are the two important criteria for the donor and after that we collect the blood the blood is collected in a sack containing 75 ml of cpd now, you may be wondering what is this cpd now see here this cpd is citrate phosphate dextrose solution and it is mixed it is already there in the sack and blood is collected there so the blood and the cpd will mix with each other and it is stored in a special refrigerator at 4 degree celsius 4 degree celsius so we need to maintain this temperature there otherwise okay uh, the components of the blood will be lysing quite early and there is a chance of contamination also cpd blood lasts for 3 weeks and after 3 weeks we have to discard it even uh, if it is a uh, you know Uh, if the quantity of the blood is a lot in the blood bank, probably after that that time, that blood is relatively not useful. So CPD, okay, citrate phosphate dextrose. This is the solution which is mixed to the blood to increase the life of that component of the blood, especially RBC. Let's move on. Okay. Now, in a stored blood, please mute yourself. In a stored blood, RBC lasts for three weeks. So, what is the life span of RBC? One twenty days or one twenty days. One twenty days. Very good. One twenty days. 
See there, 120 days. But that 120 days life is inside the human being that is in the blood. And having said that, if we take blood from that person, then there are different type of RBC, which are having different lifespan. Some of the RBC are probably in the terminal stages of their lifespan. Some are very new and some are in the middle. It is always like that. Please remember like that, okay? So when we take that, uh, you know, blood from the patient, we can only, you know, store that blood for three weeks, not more than that, because of that reason. Because we don't know how many RBCs are towards the terminal, you know, phase of their lifespan. WBCs are destroyed quite rapidly in the stored blood. Platelets also get reduced in 24 hours. So if we want to give a, you know, platelet transfusion, it should be fresh, fresh blood. Or uh, if there are platelet concentrate, uh, uh, then you can give that. And clotting factors are levile, and so their level fall very quickly. Levile means they can also, you know, neutralize very quickly. So stored blood, only RBC lasts for three weeks. All other components will be inactivated quite early. Now, there is one other information which you need to know here. Please uh, pay attention. Pack cells are stored these days in SAGM solution. Now, this SAGM solution means it is normal saline. This S is normal saline, or you can also call it sodium chloride, because saline means sodium chloride. Adenine, G for glucose, and M for mannitol. So this is a combination of these substances together. So why pack cells are stored with this substance? To increase their shelf life up to five weeks, okay? At two to six degrees centigrade. Now see there, if we have mixed this pack cell with CPD solution, we can store only for three weeks. But once we have added this SAGM solution to them, we can extend their life to five weeks. So this is a you know, great advantage of two weeks we have. And that's why these days, SAGM solution is commonly added to the, you know, those, you know, sacks of the blood, which are stored in the blood bank. Now, you may be wondering how, how it acts, okay? You don't, we don't need to know uh, very much detail regarding this, just know one thing. These substances which are uh, added there, will stabilize the membrane of the RBC. They stabilize the membrane of the RBC so that the lifespan of this RBC will be a little bit extended. They will not getting broken very early. Now, regarding the blood fractions, let's talk about pack cells. Okay, pack cell. Pack cells are also known as hematocrit. Hematocrit, which is a very common term when you order CBC, that is called pack cell. So it is obtained by centrifuging the whole blood, 2000 to 3000 gravity for 15 to 20 minutes. This G means gravity, okay? This is the unit by which we measure centrifuging, okay? Or centrifugation, you can say. So we rotate or centrifuge the whole blood around 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, we, you know, separate pack cells. Now, each unit is approximately 330 ml and has a hematocrit of 50 to 70 percent. This is a high hematocrit. Now, I will provide some important example to you now. A healthy person, okay, will have hematocrit around three times of hemoglobin. Now, if your, your hemoglobin is 15, Okay, your hematocrit is around 45. That's it. But in this type of pack cell fraction, look at the uh, hematocrit here, it is quite high. It is used in chronic anemia situation, we already talked about, in old age and in children also. Okay, in a proper indication in children because uh, their heart. Uh, may not function properly. And if we give too much fluid along with the RBC, probably heart cannot handle, okay? In children, especially in malnourished children, we again go for pack cells. 
Now, why is the question? And it's answer here, to minimize the cardiac overload due to transfusion, you go for back cell transfusion. It can be stored at one to six degrees centigrade for 35 days. See that, 35 days, just above one month. It is not like whole blood, which can be stored for three to five months. It can be stored for only 35 days at one degree to six degrees centigrade. Now, another type of blood fraction is the plasma. Okay, plasma. Now, this is important one. Now, plasma is also obtained in the same way as back cells by centrifugation. And this plasma are indicated in burns, hypoalbuminemia, and severe protein loss. Now, why are they indicated in this situation? What they have? What this plasma have? Yes? Albumin. Plasma protein, sir. Albumin. Protein. Exactly. Albumin. Exactly. So we need that plasma protein for that, sir. Yes. And they also, have... sir, they contain coagulation factors which increase the healing. Exactly. So plasma, now what is plasma? Let me start from the very beginning. The whole blood, okay, is centrifuged and we take you know, those blood cells from there. We separate blood cells from there, like RBC, WBC, platelet, and the remaining thing is called plasma. This is important. So plasma has a lot of plasma proteins. The most important one is albumin. Another is globulins, or different types of antibodies, okay? Apart from them, plasma is also having clotting factors. Absolutely correct. That's why in those typical type of situation, we give plasma to the patient. See here, burns, I already told you, there is a lot of protein loss in the burns. Hypoalbuminemia, different situation, like protein losing enteropathy from the GI tract, okay? We may give uh, albumin transfusion, like uh, celiac disease. It's a perfect example of malabsorption. There is hypoalbuminemia, so we can give plasma or simply albumin in that situation. It can be fractionized into different fragment, like human albumin. 4.5% is obtained after repeated fractionation and can be stored for several months in the liquid form at four degrees centigrade. So in clinical practice, this human albumin 4.5% is very commonly utilized, okay? Now you may be wondering what is this 4.5%? This 4.5% is 45 gram per liter, 45 gram of albumin per liter, or, okay, 4.5 gram per 100 ml. This is the way, this is the way we, we interpret it. Now, another type of blood fraction is fresh frozen plasma. Okay, fresh frozen plasma, now see here. This fresh frozen plasma obtained, just like you know, uh, plasma is obtained. Now, after we obtain the plasma, it is rapidly frozen and is stored at minus 40 degrees centigrade. That's why we call it frozen plasma. Now, what are the advantages of this? It contains all type of coagulation factors. Now, see here, one unit of fresh frozen plasma increases the clotting or coagulation factors level by 3% in our body. So this is a huge advantage. So in, in coagulopathy situation, we can safely give fresh frozen plasma and it helps the patient. It can be stored for two years at that particular temperature, minus 40. And a research D positive fresh frozen plasma can be transfused to research D negative female. Now, this is a, uh, you know, advantage, uh, see here, just try to understand this. Research D positive means RS positive, fresh frozen plasma can be transfused to research D negative or RS negative female. But can we transfuse research D positive RBC to research D negative, you know, RBC, a patient who is having research D negative RBC? Can we do that? No, sir. No, no. sir. Exactly. The answer is no. Because 
these ant antigens are present only on RBC. They are not present in the plasma. So plasma is safe to get transfused, but not the RBC. That's the meaning. We'll talk about this topic in detail, okay? That is coming uh, in, uh, that will be discussed probably in the coming classes. Now, what are the uses of fresh frozen plasma? We'll look at the indications here. Severe liver disease with abnormal coagulation function. You all know by this time that any type of severe and chronic liver disease results in coagulopathy. So we need to transfuse fresh frozen plasma. A good example is cirrhosis of the liver. Another is acute hepatocellular failure. Okay. Another use, congenital clotting factor deficiency. The congenital means from the time of birth, certain clotting factor may be deficient. Okay, that can, that can be any, like fibrinogen deficiency, factor eight deficiency. Deficiency following warfarin therapy. Now, warfarin is a type of anticoagulant. It's a type of anticoagulant and we say Warfarin acts as an antagonizing factor for vitamin K. Okay, so for the treatment, okay, for the treatment, what we do if there is a warfarin uh, the, uh, given to the patient and if there is a lot of bleeding done by warfarin, what is the antidote of that warfarin therapy? Anybody? What we do? What's, what substance we give uh, if a person develops bleeding after warfarin therapy? Who can answer uh, this? Sir, we give, uh, sir, we give vitamin K, like sir. Uh, vitamin K, sir. Vitamin, 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 vitamin K. Vitamin K. Exactly. Supplement vitamin K. Vitamin K. Exactly. You can simply say vitamin K. That's the very correct answer. Very nice. Vitamin K. Okay. But remember that vitamin K will be utilized by the liver to form active clotting factors. But if liver itself is damaged, then that action cannot be done properly. So during that time, we can go for fresh frozen plasma. We can go for fresh frozen plasma. That's the meaning. In case of DIC and massive transfusion also, we can give fresh frozen plasma, okay? Because of a lack of those clotting factors. Another type of fraction of the blood is cryoprecipitate. Please pay attention. This is also an important question from the exam point of view. Cryoprecipitate. What is the meaning? Now, cryo means cold. The meaning of cryo is cold. Okay. So when fresh frozen plasma is allowed to thaw at 4 degree. Remember, we have stored fresh frozen plasma in minus 40 degree. When that fresh frozen plasma is allowed to thaw at just four degree, a visible white supernatant layer will be developed there. And that is known as cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate, which is very rich in factor eight and fibrinogen level. So these are the indication of cryoprecipitate transfusion. In case of hemophilia, we can safely give it. In case of fibrinogen deficiency, we can give it. After it is formed, it is stored at minus 40 to minus 50 degree and can be kept for up to two years. So it can be stored for a long time and it is given in low fibrinogen state and in case of factor A deficiency, which is known as hemophilia. So what information you need to remember from this? Cryoprecipitate is formed after fresh frozen plasma is thawed. Okay, and it is important factor uh, to, to be given to the patient in case of hemophilia disease and fibrinogen deficiency. And it can be stored at a particular temperature for up to two years. Now, another blood fraction is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, it is obtained by organic liquid fractionation of plasma and it is stored in dried form. It is very useful in DIC and a fibrinogenemia. You see that in DIC, in DIC, all clotting factors are utilized, even fibrinogen utilized. So that develops hypofibrinogenemia in DIC. And this is a congenital problem. There is no fibrinogen at all. So there is a high chance of bleeding. So we need to give 
fibrinogen from outside. Okay, there is a slight risk of transmitting hepatitis by fibrinogen. Which hepatitis? Yes, which hepatitis? Was this topic discussed before? The hepatitis viruses to anywhere? Then only I can ask this question to you. Probably not, right? So just uh, listen properly. There are five important types of, uh, you know, hepatitis viruses. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, C, D, and E. Among them, hepatitis A and hepatitis E, they are entering into our body through fecal-oral route. Fecal oral route means food and water, which are contaminated. Whereas hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and hepatitis D, they enter into our body okay, through parenteral route. Okay. Parenteral means blood transfusion, sexual activity, some syringes, okay, organ uh, donation, something like that. So now you got the answer here. Now, what are the other types of uh, blood uh, fractions apart from them, which we just discussed? Platelet-rich plasma, platelet concentrate, and prothrombin complex concentrate. Okay, so there are the different types. So platelet-rich plasma is obtained by centrifugation of freshly donated blood at 150 to 200 G for 15 to 20 minutes. You don't need to know this. Okay, this is not our job. It is already prepared like that. So we just need to order it in particular situation. That should be known by the doctor. That means, what are the indications for platelet-rich plasma? Now, those indications would be platelet deficiency disorders, okay, which are known as thrombocytopenia because of any condition. If there is a critically low level of platelet, then we have to order platelet-rich plasma. Or better than that, would be platelet concentrate because there is no, no plasma there. The plasma component is also removed. Okay, so platelet concentrate are always better than platelet with plasma. Now, see this? They are used in thrombocytopenia and drug like aspirin or clopidogrel induced hemorrhage. Now, what type of drug are aspirin and clopidogrel? What type of drugs? Blood and thinner. Blood thinner Now, they are actually known as anti platelet drug. Okay. So they are not known as anticoagulants. So you have need to correct your answer there. They are not known as anticoagulants. They are anti platelet. Yes, their function, uh, you know, ultimately is they also, you know, antagonizes the blood coagulation. So they act like an anticoagulant, but they are not called as anticoagulant drug. Whenever your teacher asks anticoagulant, your answer is heparin and warfarin. Heparin, either conventional heparin or low molecular weight heparin. These are known as uh, uh, aspirin and clopidogrel, antiplatelet drug. Now you got an answer. Because antiplatelet drug can induce hemorrhage or bleeding. And in that situation, we can give platelet concentrate to counter them. Another blood fraction is a prothrombin complex concentrate. So it is derived from pooled plasma, which contains factor 2, factor 9, and factor 10. And it is also used in emergency reversal of warfarin therapy in uncontrolled hemorrhage. That is called warfarin-induced hemorrhage. Okay, not commonly used in clinical practice. Now, before moving uh, further, let's talk a little bit once again about this SAGM blood. What is the full form of this? Okay, it is important uh, question from the exam point of view, especially in the MCQ part. A proportion of donations with the plasma removed and will be replaced by crystalloid solution of SAGM. S stands for sodium chloride, or you can also remember it like a saline, normal saline, okay? A stands for adenine, G stands for glucose and hydrate, or simply glucose, you can remember like that, and for mannitol. These are the substances. And the advantages of adding them in the blood is, this allows good viability of cells. 
it extends the lifespan of the cells which are present there. It is devoid of any protein because certain amount of plasma is already removed. So it is devoid of any protein and it is very useful in any mix situation because we don't have any protein, we don't have any plasma there. It has uh, RBC and those RBCs are having increased lifespan. So they are very useful in chronic anemic situation. Now, before we uh, donate or transfuse blood, we transfuse blood, I should say, what are the precautions we need to take? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. This is a practical type of information and every medical student should know this. For every four units of SAGM blood, one whole blood has to be given. Now, why is this? Because SAGM blood only having, you know, pack cells. It doesn't have a much of plasma, okay, as well as a plasma proteins or albumin. So that is the reason. Later, for every two units of SAGM blood, one unit of 4.5% human albumin has to be given. The same reason works here also. Coagulation status and platelet count should be checked regularly. After grouping and cross-matching, 540 ml of blood is transfused in four hours. That is 40 drops per minute using a filtered drip set. Now see here, it contains 540 ml of blood okay, in a packet and that is usually given in four hours. That means you don't need to write this, you know, the sisters will calculate this for you. You just give, give this much blood in four hours. They will do that. They will set this 40 drops per minute on their own using a filter drip set. It is also available there. Now, what is blood grouping and what is blood cross matching? Let me ask this question to you. What is grouping? Grouping means what? Checking the type of blood. ABO blood like system. AB, ABO, ABO blood. O negative, O positive, etc. Exactly. This is blood group. And, and what is cross matching? And cross matching is checking the RH incompatibility or any uh, antigen or anti Oh, board donor and we should arrange in between a donor and blood group. Any sort of transfusion reaction, sir. Ebu and Rehesh's typing of recipe. Exactly, I got your meaning. Many of the students have this, you know, concept because we have talked about this before. So, blood grouping is very easy. If I go to the hospital, any clinic or any hospital, they want to check my blood group. Which blood group I have? Is it A? Is it B? Is it O? Or is it AB? This is called blood grouping. And it is positive or negative. Means whether I have that RH antigen present or not. Okay? So if you ask me, I am AB positive. Okay? I am AB positive. Means I have RH antigen in my RBC. Okay? And... Uh, AB is the blood group. So that is the meaning. And always remember one thing, if you are working in certain hospital or clinic, don't believe the patient's report which they have brought from outside, especially regarding blood group. Whether, uh, you know, if you have decided to transfuse the blood in that particular patient, you need to do this in your own lab, okay? And you need to see that in the written form. Don't believe whatever they say. You need to see that in the written form because that will be evidence for later on. Now, let's talk about cross-matching. Cross-matching means whether the blood which is there, which is donated, can be given to the recipient or not without any reaction. I need to make sure this in the beginning. Okay? So, I need to take the plasma from the recipient and RBC from the donor. RBC from the donor and plasma from the recipient and I'll mix them together. If there is no reaction, this blood is safe to be transfused. This is known as cross matching. This has to be done all the time before any type of transfusion. Now, one liter of the blood contains 350 milligram of iron. Look at the amount of iron 
this is a very high level of iron in the blood and what happens to this iron all of this is going inside the body all of this now let's talk a little bit about iron metabolism in our body the normal excretion of iron is just 1 mg per day our body cannot excrete iron in a large amount and a lot of iron is going inside the body so if a person is repeatedly getting transfused within a short period of time he or she will develop iron overload condition okay iron overload condition and that is not the good condition to have because this iron iron is a is an example of heavy metal so it may be deposited in different organs of our body like in the heart in the liver in endocrine organs even in the pancreas and it can damage all of those organs so person can die because of heart failure and because of arrhythmia person can develop diabetes okay and so many other problem so just to avoid this situation if a person is getting recurrent transfusion we need to give iron chelating agent that is known as desferoxamine okay so that the excessive iron is excreted out from the body. This is very important knowledge. Now, one small question to you. What are those situations where a person needs to be getting blood almost every month? What are those situations? Anemia, thalassemia. Very good. One is thalassemia. Excellent. Thalassemia. Excellent example. Any, any other? And instead of anemia, yes. Okay. Now those situations are you have correctly picked one that is beta thalassemia major. Without transfusion, the child is going to die. Okay, until and unless you go for bone marrow transplantation. Okay. Uh, another example is aplastic anemia or hypoplastic anemia because the bone marrow is not synthesizing any RBC we need to give that from outside. There is no other way. Another may be leukemia. In leukemia treatment also, the child needs recurrent blood transfusion until and unless we go for definite therapy. Okay, so these are some of the important points here. Let's move further. Let's talk about what the complications of blood transfusion, very important part of this lecture. As a medical student or as a doctor, we need to know about the complications of blood transfusion. Because this is a very important, you know, thing which you do every day in the hospital. Congestive cardiac failure can occur after giving blood. But if the person is healthy, okay, that doesn't usually happen. Healthy means if there, he or she has a healthy heart. But if there is a, some problem in the heart already, on top of that, if we give you know, fluid from outside, then of course, there's a chance of heart failure. Okay, Heart failure usually occur if we give whole blood or if we give plasma. That's why in those situations, we go for a pack cell transfusion. Congestive cardiac failure very commonly occurs in malnourished child in case of pediatrics. That is a, a definite problem there. And if we give large volume transfusion, then congestive cardiac failure can occur. Another important types of complications are transfusion reactions. Now, what are these? These are incompatibility, are also known as blood incompatible reaction. If we give wrong blood to the patient, for example, patient is A positive, and if I give B positive blood, okay, it will be a major problem. There is a massive acute hemolytic reaction occurs. That hemolysis will release a lot of hemoglobin outside. Those hemoglobin can block the renal tubules, and the person can have acute renal failure because of this. The person can even die. Some minor type of reactions are also quite common to occur, and they are Fever, okay, rigor, pain on the body, a joint, and even slight amount of hypotension. So these are uh, easy to manage. And if hypotension is excessive, then we think about major reaction. Another 
type of transmission reaction is pyrexial reaction or fever. We can manage this by simple NSAID like paracetamol. You don't need to worry much. Other allergic reactions can occur because uh, blood is having proteins and proteins are allergic to some of the people. So they may simply develop some rashes on the body. That's why to avoid this allergic reaction, we need to use washed out blood, okay? The contaminants, the you know, other things are removed there. Sensitization to leukocyte and platelet can occur. And later on, they can cause a reaction in the second or third transfusion. And immunological sensitization is uh, done by HLA. If HLA doesn't match, human leukocyte antigen doesn't match between the donor and the recipient, then there is immunological sensitization occur. So these are some of the problems. Let's move on. Now look at this, uh, you know, slide. It is uh, clearly, you know, telling it in a very easy way. A, allergic. F is febrile. H for hemolytic reactions. So these are the allergic reaction. Mild facial flushing, uh, hives or rashes. Okay, hives or rashes. Severe uh, increased anxiety, wheezing, and decreased blood pressure. So these are the upper two are mild and the uh, uh, lower three are severe type reactions, okay? Wheezing occurs in case of narrowing of lower or smaller airway. So this is considered a bit severe one. Among the febrile, okay, what is hive? Probably this is a new term for you. What is hive? Yes? Sir, it is a type of uh, reaction like. Sir, it's like an arctic area. Yeah. Uh, it is a kind of yeah. skin, the type of skin reaction with red uh, and like an itchy surface and some bumpy. It will be swelled. Exactly. You can simply say it is like urticaria. Very good. It is urticaria actually. Hive means urticaria. Okay. Those rashes are elevated or swollen, uh, and, and then they can be palpable, but they are very itchy. They are very itchy. Now the febrile reactions uh, can lead to headache, tachycardia, tachypnea chills, a bit rigor also, and anxiety. They are very easy to manage. You don't need to panic here. Just give a simple paracetamol to control that. And the hemolytic reactions are very severe. They can result in hypertension, increased respiratory rate, hemoglobinuria, which can result in kidney failure, chest pain, apprehension, low back pain, okay, fever, tachycardia, and chills. So these things are repeated in most of the things. So this low back pain is again because of you know a blockage of some of the small uh, capillaries or circulation uh, by these different products. Infections are quite common after blood transfusion, especially if the blood which you are going to transfuse is not monitored properly or is not screened properly. Like these are the common infection. Very important question from the exam point of view. Okay, so please pay attention. Serum hepatitis, especially hepatitis B and C. Hepatitis B and C. Hepatitis D always follows hepatitis B. So once you take the name of hepatitis B, D will, will be along with that. HIV, very important virus, which is trans, transmitted by blood transfusion, HIV. There are different, you know, uh, you know incidents which has occurred all over the world, that people are getting HIV without proper screening of the blood. Bacterial infection, quite common because of the contamination, malaria transmission, okay? Uh, what is the, uh, you know, causative agent of malaria? What is the causative agent? Plasmodium. 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 Very good. Plasmodium, there are so many. There are five species of plasmodium. Plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium vivex, Plasmodium ovel, Plasmodium malari, and Plasmodium naulesi. Among them, Plasmodium falciparum is the most severe one. Epstein Barr virus infection can be transmitted by blood. Cytomegalovirus infection can be transmitted by blood. Syphilis. What is the causative agent of syphilis? Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum. Exactly. Triponema, triponema pallidum. Triponema pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis that can also be transmitted through blood. And Ersinia, okay, 
Ersinia is the causative agent of plague, Ersinia pestis. Another type of Ersinia is Ersinia enterocolitica, okay, that can be GI infection. That Ersinia enterocolitica can be easily transmitted by blood rather than Ersinia pestis. Triponosoma cruzi, okay, Triponosoma cruzi infection. Now, there are uh, two types of Triponosoma Triponosoma brucei and Triponosoma cruzi. Triponosoma brucei is called African sleeping sickness, and Triponosoma cruzi is called American sleeping sickness. Okay, these are the name of the disease which is caused by this pathogen that can Chagas also disease. be, yes, Chagas disease. Very good. Chagas disease is known as uh, American sleeping sickness, it is caused by cruzi. So, this can be transmitted with blood. So remember, the important one are hepatitis B and HIV. After that, malaria and cytomegalovirus infection. Now, air embolism can occur during blood transfusion. Now, how air embolism occurs? If the monitoring was not properly done by the sisters, the blood packet is already empty, but the cannula is not taken out, then some of the blood, uh, sorry, some of the air bubble may enter into the vein can lead to air embolism but this type of air embolism is not very serious because very slight amount of air will go inside but nevertheless you can list here as a complication thrombophlebitis can occur okay this is infection uh, or inflammation of vein the superficial vein through which the blood transfusion is given Let's move on. Now, this is the same, same thing which is written in other way. Okay, it's up to you. Whatever you can, you know, answer or whatever way you can answer. These are early complication. These are delayed or late complication of blood transfusion. In early complication, you can list acute transfusion reactions like major life-threatening or minor. Major life-threatening or hemolysis, which is also known as ABO incompatibility gram-negative bacteremia when you give the contaminated blood and anaphylactic, anaphylaxis or anaphylactic reaction, okay, which can lead to acute hypotension. These are the life-threatening ones. People can die because of this. And minor urticaria or hives and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. Another very serious type of uh, condition is known as trali. This is transfusion-associated acute lung injury, trali it can result in pulmonary edema. In pulmonary edema is always a serious condition. Pulmonary edema means fluid collection inside the alveoli. Now the mechanism is very interesting here. The mechanism for trali is because of the interaction between okay, the HLA antibody, which are present in the donor plasma, okay, donor plasma and their interaction with neutrophils of the host neutrophils of the host will interact with HLA antibody of the donor and those neutrophils will be activated and they can release certain cytokine. Those cytokines are, are essential for the trali reaction there. Now, regarding the delayed or late uh, complications of blood transfusion, okay, delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, it will take some time. That's why it is called delayed because the antibody formation may take certain time transfusion associated graft versus host disease. I'm sure you have studied this already in immunology. Graft versus host disease means, okay, the WBC, which are present on the graft. Now in this condition, graft means that the donor blood is called graft and host is the recipient. So those WBC, which are present on the donor blood may damage the host organ that is known as graft versus host disease. It can happen. Transfusion transmitted infection, we already you know, discussed a big list and iron overload, don't forget that. Okay, so whatever way you can answer, it's up to you, but the point should be there. Now, see there, complications of blood transfusion, coagulation failure, coagulation failure. What do you mean by that? It can occur because of dilution of the clotting factors, because of DIC, 
and because of dilutional thrombocytopenia. When we give massive blood transfusion, okay, the clotting factors and the thrombocyte or platelets are diluted. So they result in coagulopathy. And DIC can occur in massive blood transfusion as well. Hemochromatosis is iron overload condition. You already know the meaning. There are two types, primary hemochromatosis and secondary. Now, primary is a genetic disease. So this is not a case of primary. Here. This has to be secondary because patient has developed it after receiving repeated blood transfusion. And how, to, how do we tackle this hemochromatosis and iron overload condition? Which drug we give now? Yes. Which drug? Dexoperoxamide. Very good. More increases. Exactly. You can say we can give iron chelating agent. This is known as iron chelating agent or iron binding agent. A perfect example is desferoxamine. Desferoxamine. It will bind with that iron, make that iron soluble, and iron is excreted through the urine. This is known as iron chelating agent. So see that hemochromatosis and iron overload, we can handle like that. Another is a citrate intoxication. A citrate, CPD, is present in the blood. Okay, CPD. It causes bradycardia and hypocalcemia. The intoxication of citrate, if citrate is there in the increased amount, of course, it will enter into the body as an increased amount. If you give massive blood transfusion, it can lead to bradycardia and hypocalcemia. So for every four units of blood, around 10 ml of 10% calcium chloride or calcium gluconate should be infused intravenously just to counteract that hypocalcemia. What can happen if hypocalcemia is not treated? Yes? What are the clinical features? Renal stone. Yes. No, hypocalcemia, not hyper, hypo. Hypo. Okay. So what is the what is the clinical feature? That is called tetany. Tetany. Okay. The nerves are irritated. Exactly. There is a spasm of the muscle Numbness because of irritation of the nerve. This is known as tetany. Remember the Vostek sign. Okay. Remember carpopedal spasm. All these are features of hypocalcemia. We have taken a class regarding this, you know, uh, in pediatrics. So that can happen. So just to treat that in time, you need to give calcium gluconate or calcium chloride IV. But remember, it has to be given very slowly. Now this you can go through on your own, okay? This is a very you know good way of remembering for a long time. In one slide, everything is written and what you do in the hospital, what you order to the nurses, all these things are written here, okay? Please go through them. Now, we are towards the end of this topic of blood transfusion. Now, some of the blood substitute are there. Uh, let's talk about it. What are those substitute of the blood? One is human albumin, 4.5%. Okay, this is used as a substitute of blood, and this is also known as a colloid. A colloid. Blood is also colloid, and this human albumin is also colloid. So let me, uh, you know, uh, tell you some important points about colloid and crystalloid right now. Now, can you give me the example of crystalloid? Crystalloid. Which are crystalloid? Ringer. Ringer lactate. Lactate ringer, sir. And, and one more. Very good. One more. Normal solution. Hartman solution. Sir, the buffer solution, sir. The acetate, sir, the acetate and gluconate uh, buffer solution, sir. And HCL solution, you've got dextrose and water. Okay. Now, see this. You have said so many things, but only these two are called as crystalloid. Ringer lactate and normal saline. All others are the IV fluid, okay? You are absolutely right. These are the IV fluid, which we can give to the patient as a maintenance fluid. But in case of resuscitation, we don't give dextrose containing fluid. We don't give Hartman solution, nothing like that. Yes. You need ringer lactate and normal saline because they're isotonic fluid, okay? Isotonic means the osmolality of this fluid is just like plasma. That's why we, we give this 
these are crystal white never forget this now the point, if you want to choose between ringer lactate and normal saline ringer lactate is the best still ringer lactate is our first choice if we give a massive amount of iv fluid to the patient absolutely because the normal saline okay can uh, result in that complication which you just told okay yes that that will be discussed in uh, some other other lecture don't worry now i'm talking okay. about the colloid now what is colloid here colloid has the bit of heavier uh, fluid or heavier solution like albumin like blood okay blood and cert certain substance called as dextran which we are going to talk now dextran these are called colloid now, what is the basic difference between them still i have not told that to you why we have we want to go, go for crystalloid in the beginning and if they do not work then only we go for colloid the reason is okay crystalloid has to be given three times Okay, then only they will replace the amount of blood lost because they do not stay inside the intravascular compartment. They can quickly diffuse outside and they can go outside. Whereas colloid, okay, whatever colloid you give, that will stay inside the intravascular compartment and quickly you know, recover whatever the blood volume is lost. But still, in the clinical practice, you never start with colloid. You always give crystalloid first. And among the two crystalloid we have, ringer lactate is our first choice in case of massive type of transfusion, whereas normal saline can also be given in a slight amount of transfusion. Okay, now let's move on. So in one human albumin is one of them, 4.5 portion. There is no risk of transmitting hepatitis in this. Another is a dextran. Let me underline this, dextran, okay. It is useful to improve plasma volume because this is a type of colloid. They are polysaccharide of varying molecular weight and there are low molecular weight dextran. We call it dextran 40. It is very effective in restoring blood volume immediately. But small molecules are readily excreted in kidney, so effect is transitory. So what is the take home messages? This is one of the option for the you know, uh, transfusion and this is one of the substitute of blood. This is an example of colloid here. Another is high molecular weight dextran. We call it dextran 110 and dextran 70. This is according to the molecular weight or according to the, you know, um, what should I say, the, how heavy is the solution? Just remember like that, how heavy is the solution? It is less effective, but long acting and so useful to have prolonged effect. Let's move on. Now, there are certain precautions for giving dextran. It interferes with platelet function, and so it may precipitate the abnormal bleeding. So we need to be you know, careful. We don't give uh, too much dextran uh, to the patient. That is not more than 1,000 ml. And usually, we, 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 there is no indication to give excessive dextran also. Another example of uh, colloid is gelatin. Gelatin, okay? It is used as a plasma expander or as a form of colloid, and it can also be given up to 1,000 ml or one liter. And this is a percentage of gelatin, and uh, it is also known as hemaxyl in the clinical practice. Very commonly used term. When you start working in the hospital, you can hear this hemaxyl from the senior doctors, okay? That means it's a type of gelatin. Now, at the end, let's talk about what do you mean by massive blood transfusion? Massive. Now, it is defined as a replacement or transfusion of blood equivalent to patient's blood volume in less than 24 hour time. Now, some important points are quickly coming here. What is the blood volume of this patient. That is one thing you need to know here. And if we give that much blood in less than 24 hour duration or time, it is known as massive blood transfusion. Okay, now see here. In adult, we say five to six liters of the blood is present inside that individual. is an on average, okay? But 
some of the patient they are very thinly built and some of the patients are quite overweight or obese so according to the body weight the blood volume differs in them and according to the age also the blood volume differs so see there in infant it is 85 ml per kg of body weight this is the amount of blood so in 3 kg baby 3 kg how much blood is present in that in that baby now just multiply it by 3 how much it would be okay 245 okay or 2 uh, 200 or yes 255 255 exactly just 255 ml blood is present inside that body now if i use okay similar type of formula to calculate the amount of blood volume in us let's say this is a 50 kg person and in in the adult you know we say there is a 8% of uh, you know blood inside the body so let's say this is a 80 ml per kg so 4 liter is the answer so it is like that okay so we have certain guideline how much blood is there inside the body if a single blood transfusion is more than 2500 ml then we also call it massive blood transfusion in one packet of the blood it is around 500 ml okay to be very precise it's 450 so 450 is one packet so to to crush this 200 okay 2500 ml you no know, i need to give more than six packet there of course that is a massive transfusion and it is needed by some of the patient who are actively bleeding massive transfusion is used in severe trauma associated with liver injury blood vessel cardiac pulmonary and pelvic injury these are the serious type of injuries in the patient just think of a situation if abdominal aorta is ruptured or there is a aneurysm in the abdominal aorta and that is ruptured that can give rise to massive hemorrhage in peritoneal cavity think about liver rupture think about spleen rupture okay think about okay the ventricular aneurysm which is present in the heart and that is ruptured so many different examples we can give here often it is required during surgical bleeding that is primary hemorrhage in the table of major surgery that cannot be avoided and sometimes the surgeon may make certain mistakes you know we all are human being we can make certain mistakes and there may be a bit more bleeding from the patient how to tackle that we have to give blood from our side now what are the adverse effect of this massive transfusion this is not a good thing for the patient why because there are lots of adverse effect happening now see here severe electrolyte imbalance like hypocalcemia okay hypocalcemia then hyperkalemia hyperkalemia and acidosis hypocalcemia hyperkalemia and acidosis now some of these electrolyte imbalance are because of the substances which are present in the blood just now we talked about the cpd which is present in the blood will give rise to hypocalcemia hyperkalemia now i am sure student can answer this on their own why hyperkalemia occurs after massive transfusion yes why more potassium retention occurs that causes hyperkalemia okay but where where what is the source of that potassium where from where the potassium enters into the patient how sir uh, rbc are the bag of potassium the rbc sir um, sir basically sir the the supernent of store rbc cell like potassium potassium is stored in the blood cell sir which increase due to decrease in the atp there sir exactly you are absolutely right the source of potassium is rbc which we gave in the patient now remember i always tell this i've repeated so many times inside that one unit of the blood there are different phases of the life span of rbc some rbcs are quite old 
some are some are in the middle of their lifespan and some are quite young as well when rbc become old you know they leak a bit of potassium outside potassium is very you know increasingly present inside the cell so in relatively older blood there is high level of potassium and fresh blood has less amount of potassium present okay remember this so if we give massive type of blood transfusion naturally there is a lot of potassium present in the blood because of you know hemolysis because of from those old rbcs and things like that so hyperkalemia is a very important adverse effect of mercy transfusion now what message you have got you have to check potassium after mercy transfusion you have to do electrocardiography to know what is the effect of that excessive potassium in the patient's heart and if it is present manage accordingly okay what is the drug of choice in case of hyperkalemia to stabilize the heart which drug you give which drug which is that amiodarone no no not amiodarone to stabilize the heart because of hyperkalemia what which drug sodium. you give calcium gluconate sodium gluconate it is calcium gluconate calcium gluconate okay remember this this type of questions are very commonly asked in the exam yes sodium bicarbonate can be given there is no doubt about it but it will be given a bit later first of all i want to prevent the heart i want to protect the heart so calcium gluconate is the drug of choice or the first drug in case of hyperkalemia now acidosis occur okay very commonly uh, in case of a massive blood transfusion there are multiple reasons for this okay this is mainly metabolic acidosis now as some of the students already told the you know 2 3 dpg concentration is decreasing in the stored blood the 2 3 dpg is very essential for unloading of the oxygen so uh, uh, unloading of the oxygen if it is not happening then there is tissue hypoxia tissue hypoxia can easily give rise to anaerobic respiration that gives rise to lactic acidosis that is a cause of metabolic acidosis there regarding coagulopathy okay there are altered platelet and coagulation factor in a massive blood transfusion because of dilution this is mainly because of dilution citrate toxicity hypothermia because of relatively cold type of blood and you have given it in a large volume so patient may develop hypothermia poor oxygen delivery just now i talked about this infection chance incompatibility and transfusion reaction that can only happen if you do not check it properly and ards acute respiratory distress syndrome this is an uh, example of trally okay transfusion related acute lung injury trally we say uh, it is an a type of ards so these all are a different type of adverse effect of massive blood transfusion so before i stop this topic let me revise some of the very very important points okay all of you listen properly here blood transfusion okay is the most common type of treatment which we do every day in the hospital one of the most common type of treatment many of the patient receives blood but remember we don't give blood just like that there has to be proper indication to give blood because blood transfusion has a lot of risk involved a lot of risk involved and the risk and the adverse effect you have seen now in this class before giving blood to any patient make sure what is the blood group of this patient you do it right there okay and look it in the written form do cross matching if it is safe to give then only transfuse to the patient now sometimes what happens we order blood from the blood bank and we completely trust them or believe them and sometimes what happen they have not done their job properly they have not done those you know important screening test properly there may be you know viruses present there like hiv this type of incidents have happened in so many different places of the world and people are getting hiv because of blood transfusion now who will be responsible remember your hospital is responsible if that happens you as a physicians 
will be responsible. And then only that blood bank will be drawn uh, in that event. So this is a very sensitive issue. So what I, what I told you just now, only if it is necessary, go for blood transfusion and not uh, in the other situation. The best way to transfuse the blood is find the donor. Many family, you know, they have the donor available. Ask the donor to donate the blood and transfuse that to the patient. That is very safe rather than, you know, getting blood from the blood bank and things like that. Yes, in emergency situation, we need that. I'm not telling, but, uh, you know, there is risk involved. Okay. So with this, uh, let me stop here. We have uh, done this uh, important.